on World News Tonight. Historic shift. Sweden and Finland confirm NATO plans that comes as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Fighting the heat. A scorching heat wave slashed output in India and new price hikes expected globally with export bans. Mass shooting. Gun violence escalates in the United States and casualties have been reported in Buffalo and in California. Tonight, more details on the crisis. And celebrating Vesak. Thailand illuminates with thousands of lanterns to commemorate the birth, enlightenment and death of Buddha. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Our top story today is on a historic NATO bid. Finland and Sweden have both officially announced that they'll seek to join NATO. The announcement comes less than three months after Russia invaded Ukraine. If they join NATO, it will end decades of military neutrality for the two Nordic nations. Watchers say that it's the latest sign of how Moscow's invasion continues to impact security considerations across Europe. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Nordic countries Finland and Sweden have been strongly considering applying for NATO membership. And on Sunday, their considerations became more real. Finnish President Sawali Nanista confirmed that Finland would apply to join NATO, while Sweden's ruling Social Democrats announced an official policy change that could pave the way for Sweden's application in the coming days. If Sweden does not apply, they would be the only Nordic outsider. Other Nordic countries like Norway, Denmark and Iceland joined the pact as founding members. Finland and Sweden would like guarantees that NATO member nations would defend them while the application process is underway. Finland's president spoke to Russian President Vladimir Putin on Saturday and said their conversation did not contain any threats, despite Moscow repeatedly warning of serious consequences if the nations join NATO. Ratification can take a year as parliaments of all 30 NATO countries need to approve new members. However, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg says arrangements for the interior period can be made. We will try to speed up that process as much as possible. Many allies have stated that they will find uh, fast tracks, as for instance Germany has indicated that this can go quite fast. We uh, will look into uh, ways to provide um, security assurances, including by increasing NATO presence uh, in the region, uh, in the Baltic region, uh, uh, in and around Finland and Sweden. While many member nations such as Britain, Germany and the United States are showing support, Turkey is holding back. Turkey surprised its allies in recent days by saying it had reservations about Finnish and Swedish membership due to their support of Kurdish militant groups present on their territory. On Sunday, in a meeting with foreign ministers in Berlin, Turkey said in order to support their memberships, the Nordic nations must halt Kurdish militant support as well as lift bans on some sales of arms to Turkey. Sunday's meeting seemed promising as Turkey's foreign minister said talks with Swedish and Finnish counterparts were helpful. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken echoed those remarks. I don't want to characterize the specific conversation that we had either with the foreign minister or within the NATO sessions themselves, but I can say this much. I heard almost across the board very strong support for Finland and NATO joining the alliance if that's what they choose to do, um, and I'm very confident that we will reach consensus on that. Once vetted by NATO allies and if Turkish objections are met, approval could come in a matter of weeks. As a severe heat spell over North India worsened, the mercury at two weather stations in Delhi crossed 49 degrees Celsius, registering what's likely the highest ever temperature recorded at any Indian meteorological department station in the city. Large parts of India are anticipating more days of brutal heat, with temperatures expected to blow past records. This unprecedented heat wave has meant the vast majority of the country's poor workers, who tend to labour outdoors, are exposed to scorching temperatures. For construction worker Yugendra Tundre, life at a building site on the outskirts of the Indian capital New Delhi is hard enough. Temperatures in New Delhi have hit sweltering numbers, often causing Tundre and his wife Lata, who work at the same construction site, to fall sick. 
and for them, sick days mean no income. India suffered its hottest March in more than 100 years and parts of the country experienced their highest temperatures on record in April. Scientists have linked the early onset of an intense summer to climate change and say more than a billion people in India and neighbouring Pakistan are in some way at risk from extreme heat. Even after Tundra and Lata finish their day's work, their home is boiling, with their two young children in a slum just outside of New Delhi. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has called on state governments to draw up measures to mitigate the impact of the extreme heat. Meanwhile, it's taking a wider toll on India's ability to produce food. The country banned exports of wheat on Saturday, days after saying it was targeting record shipments this year. The scorching heatwave has cut into its wheat output and prices inside India are soaring. India banned wheat exports with immediate effect. This comes as the severe heat wave in the region has reduced the output of the world's second largest wheat exporter, driving domestic prices to an all-time high. However, the Indian government would still allow exports backed by already issued letters of credit. India banned wheat exports on Saturday as a scorching heat wave slashed output and domestic prices hit a record high. Commerce Secretary BVR Supramanyam told reporters the country would still allow some exports to fulfill existing contracts and support countries with food security needs. In the name of prohibition, we are directing the wheat trade in a certain direction. We do not want wheat to go in an unregulated manner to places where it might just get either hoarded or where it may not be used to the purpose which we are hoping it would be used for, which is serving the food requirements of vulnerable nations and vulnerable people. Officials told the news conference in New Delhi the plan is not to ban the grain's export forever and that the rule could be revised later on. The move comes just days after India said it was targeting record wheat shipments of 10 million tonnes this year. The world's second biggest wheat producer has been cashing in on a global rally in the grain's prices since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It exported a record 7 million tons of wheat in the fiscal year to March, up more than 250 percent from the previous year. Although India is not one of the world's top wheat exporters, global buyers have been relying on supplies from the country after shipments from Ukraine and its surrounding Black Sea region plunged. Analysts say the ban could now drive world food prices to new peaks, given the already tight supply, which would hit poor consumers in Asia and Africa especially hard. Supporters of abortion rights took to the streets across America to make clear that their anger at the protests that the Supreme Court will soon strike down the constitutional right to abortion. Cries of my body, my choice rang out as activity activists committed for fighting for what they called reproductive freedom. In cities across the United States Saturday, thousands of abortion rights supporters gathered in what organizers said would be a summer of rage if the U.S. Supreme Court overturns the Roe v. Wade decision that legalized abortion nationwide. More than 400 bans off our bodies marches were planned by abortion rights groups across the country in response to the May 2nd leak of a draft opinion showing the court's conservative majority ready to reverse the 1973 landmark decision, which established a federal constitutional right to terminate a pregnancy. Former member of the U.S. House of Representatives Elizabeth Holtzman joined others on Saturday. This is, a, this is a decision that treats women as objects, as less than full human beings. It puts us back. I've been fighting for women's rights for 50 years, and I'm not going to give up. People are going to find other means to get abortions, and unfortunately, it's the, you know, the lower-income minorities that are going to be the most. I mean, the more time that we waste, the more people, more women that are going to die from this. Because abortions are going to happen regardless, and it's going to result in more deaths for particularly, you know, disadvantaged and marginalized women. In the past week, protesters have gathered outside the homes of Supreme Court Justices Samuel Alito and Brett Kavanaugh, who have voted to overturn Roe v. Wade, according to the leaked opinion. Justice Clarence Thomas said at a conference in Dallas on Friday, that trust within the court was gone forever following the leak. Meanwhile, Democrats, who currently hold the House and both chambers of Congress, hope that backlash to the Supreme Court decision will carry their party's candidates to victory in congressional elections in November. But voters will be weighing abortion rights against other issues such as soaring prices of food and gas. 
and they may be skeptical of Democrats' ability to protect abortion access after efforts to pass legislation that would enshrine abortion rights in federal law failed. The Supreme Court's final ruling, which could give states the power to ban abortion, is expected in June. Gun violence has been increasing across the United States with 10 people dead in Buffalo, New York, and a gunman opened fire in a South Southern Californian church during a lunch banquet, killing the person and wounding five before. Churchgoers detained the suspect and hogtied his legs with an electrical cord. Festivities at a Southern California church turned deadly on Sunday after a gunman opened fire. Police said one person died on the scene and several others were critically injured. They also said the churchgoers detained and hogtied a suspect in his 60s with an electrical cord. The shooting occurred during a lunch banquet at the Geneva Presbyterian Church in Orange County's Laguna Woods. Police said there were dozens present inside the church during the incident. Lisa Bartlett is a district supervisor for the county. From what we know, um, there was a shooter that came in with multiple weapons and started opening fire. And fortunately, um, some of the parishioners here in the congregation jumped on the shooter and tackled him, brought him down to the ground and held him until the sheriff's department came and was able to arrest the individual. Residents were gathered outside the church in the aftermath. One said the churchgoers were of mostly Taiwanese descent. However, whether the shooting was race-related was not immediately clear. Police believe the suspect did not live in the area. It was a day after another major mass shooting in the U.S. over the weekend. On Saturday, a white 18-year-old man in Buffalo, New York, opened fire at a supermarket in a mostly black neighborhood. At least 10 were killed and several others injured in what authorities described as a purely racist attack. It's going to short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, U.S. President Joe Biden said the first summit in Washington with leaders from the Association of Southeast Asian Nations or the ASEAN marked the launch of a new era in the relationship between the U.S. and the 10-nation bloc. We're launching a new era. U.S. President Joe Biden hosted Southeast Asian leaders in Washington on Friday and held a new era in relations. While Russia's invasion of Ukraine was on the agenda of the two-day summit, Biden wanted to show that Washington remains focused on the Indo-Pacific region and the long-term challenge of its main competitor, China. Look around the world, all the challenges we're facing, the ASEAN-US partnership is critical, I think, to meeting the moment we find ourselves in history right now. It was the first time leaders from the Association of Southeast Asian Nations had gathered as a group in Washington, and it's their first meeting hosted by a US president since 2016. During the summit, Biden's administration promised $150 million in initiatives for the region, ranging from infrastructure to security, pandemic preparedness and clean energy. The two sides also committed to deepening their relationship in a joint 28-point vision statement. In her speech, Vice President Kamala Harris said the U.S. would be in the region for generations. She also stressed the need to maintain freedom of the seas, which the U.S. has said is challenged by China. Among the new commitments from the U.S. are plans to deploy a Coast Guard vessel to the region. We stand with our allies and partners in defending the maritime rules, based order, which includes freedom of navigation and international law. Neither Harris nor Biden mentioned China by name. While the ASEAN countries share many U.S. concerns about China's assertiveness, they remain cautious due to their strong economic ties with Beijing. Now, days after announcing the relaxation of New Zealand's tight border controls, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern developed symptoms and returned a positive test before another positive result from a rapid antigen test. However, her symptoms are said to be moderate. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has tested positive for COVID-19 and has moderate symptoms. That's according to a statement from her office on Saturday, which said Ardern began showing symptoms on Friday evening. Her partner Clark Gayford and their daughter both tested positive earlier in the week. Ardern is now required to isolate until the morning of May 21st and will undertake what duties she can remotely. 
She will not be in Parliament for the government's emissions reduction plan on Monday and the budget on Thursday. Deputy Prime Minister Grant Robertson will address the media in her place on Monday. In the statement, Ardern said she was gutted to miss what she called the government's milestone week. But she added that, quote, isolating with COVID-19 is a very Kiwi experience this year and my family is no different. Today represents a significant milestone in our recovery plan. On Wednesday, Ardern announced New Zealand would fully reopen its international borders on August the 1st. The country's had some of the strictest COVID measures throughout the pandemic and one of the lowest death rates in the world. Now turning to the COVID-19 situation in North Korea, the regime is now seeing its number of cases skyrocketing, coming to at almost 400,000. With the North's handling of the virus coming under fire, Kim Jong-un has lashed out on officials over medical supply issues. COVID-19 continues to take a toll on North Korea. The North's National Emergency Quarantine Command Center confirmed on Monday that 392,920 new suspected cases of the virus was reported on Sunday. There were eight additional deaths to bring the total to 50. However, figures for tallies could be underreported due to shortage in testing equipment. Amid the escalating number of infections, the regime's leader Kim Jong-un criticized the supply of medication to pharmacies during a Politburo meeting of the Central Committee of the Workers' Party of Korea on Sunday. The state-run Korean Central News Agency reported that Kim reprimanded relevant officials for the delay in supplying previously ordered medication and for failing to regulate increased stockpiling and illegal distribution of medicine. The KCNA added that Kim laid out fresh virus prevention measures during the meeting, including mobilizing troops to stabilize medical supplies in the capital, Pyongyang. Meanwhile, in an effort to contain the virus, Pyongyang has reportedly asked Beijing for antivirus supplies. According to sources familiar with North Korea-China relations on Sunday, relevant discussions are currently underway, although no further details were given. China has previously said it will immediately provide assistance upon the North's request. The border between the two countries remains closed to contain the virus but could reopen for supply shipments. However, despite attempts to curb the spread of COVID-19, forecasters say that Pyongyang could ultimately fail in their efforts, pointed to a lack of healthcare infrastructure and testing equipment in the north, which could hinder it from treating a large number of patients suffering from an infectious disease. It added the regime possesses one of the world's most fragile public health systems, and a widely unvaccinated population paints a grim picture of the future there. We have some good news for you. Hypothermia has been a big risk for maritime rescue operations. To lower this danger, a South Korean research team has developed an electric skin that produces a current and helps control body temperature underwater. In the event of a major maritime accident, underwater rescues are essential. But such operations have many risks. One of the biggest risks is that heat loss from the human body is 25 times faster in water. So the more time spent underwater, higher the risk of hypothermia. But now local researchers have developed an electric skin that will allow wearers to work underwater for longer by significantly reducing the loss of body heat. This patch of electric skin is soft and very elastic. It uses thermoelectric technology to generate electricity from the temperature difference between the cold water and the warm body. As soon as the electric skin is placed underwater, the graph shows a rise in power generation, which is 60 times higher in the water than in the air. Another advantage of the skin is that the electricity it generates can also be used to power various sensors, including an electrocardiogram, allowing real-time monitoring of underwater workers. This new electric skin can produce current continuously as long as there is a temperature difference, and the greater the difference in temperature, the higher the current produced. An attached battery can provide a more stable current in extreme environments. The team will continue their follow-up research on this electric skin to further improve its efficiency, as well as enabling this technology to work on larger skins so that it can be worn as a full outfit. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. 
Israeli and Palestinian opponents of an Israeli plan to run a cable car over Jerusalem to walls of the old city lost their Supreme Court case against the project they argued would alter the ancient landscape. Former Australian Test cricketer and two-time World Cup winner Andrew Simmons had died following a car accident in Queensland. An 18-year-old white man was arrested and charged with first-degree murder for a mass shooting at a supermarket in Buffalo, New York, an attack that authorities called racially motivated violent extremism. Tourists returned to Paris after staying away for two years because of the COVID pandemic. The Paris Tourist Office forecast a more than five-fold increase in foreign visitors in May to July compared to the same period last year. South Korean health authorities have expanded eligibility for oral COVID-19 antiviral drugs. The Central Disease Management Headquarters says that Pfizer's Paxlovid will be used for adults with children 12 years or older with a high risk of developing a severe case due to factors such as underlying diseases. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we air tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with a look at how a Thai temple celebrates Buddha's day with lighting up to 210,000 lanterns. Thank you for watching us again. Stay safe and have a good night.